What's up, everybody? Welcome to Meadow Memo, our monthly video interview series charting recent trends in cannabis retail and delivery operations. I'm your host, David Hua, CEO and co-founder of Meadow. Once a month, I sit down with dispensary operators and explore what's happening. At Meadow, we build a full suite of cannabis retail software, point of sale, delivery, cannabis marketing, compliance, inventory management, and analytics. Our goal is to make it easier to sell more cannabis with less work. The theme of today's conversation is surviving the storm. Between high taxes, 280E burdens, dropping cannabis prices, and a series of robberies, California cannabis retail operators have been hit hard by what feels like a never-ending series of challenges. Before we dive into Marie's story, let's smoke some cannabis. Today, I'm smoking Gargoyle Melon Berry from Ursa. It's a 100% live resin cartridge. And what I love about it and the packaging, it shows sort of what batch. I can actually bring up the COA. There's 12% terpenes on this. There is lemonine, humulene, and carophylline are the main three terpenes that go into this. And I'm excited to, to give it a try. Relaxing in the dominant stream. Uh, they also use a ceramic cartridge. So you can check that out, fully ceramic, pretty. And they recommend a low voltage. So I'm gonna check out this ABD Alpha battery, kind of what I'm using. It's important to find the right hardware where you can dial in the temperature. So I can make it low. So one gram cart, put this together to make it super slick. Oh, tasty. Have a bit of the berry. Tastes good, smooth, no, no nose issues. Usually I have some of that if it's too terpy, but uh, it actually goes down pretty well. They use all fresh frozen, so it's great flour. Yeah, smooth, tastes great. Today, I'll be speaking with Marie Montmarquet, co-founder of MD Numbers, a vertically integrated cannabis company spanning cultivation, distribution, and delivery that she and her brother have been operating since 2010 in the Bay Area. Good morning. Good morning. Uh... Thank you for joining me this morning. We've known each other for six years. Yeah. About six years, right? Right. But for those that uh, haven't met you or had the pleasure, you know, we work with her on her delivery service called Marie's Deliverables and but also just been in the trenches in advocacy, in education, in in therapy a little bit, <laughs> just empathizing with one another. It's been a, it's been a wild ride. But uh, if you if you don't mind, maybe you know, give it a little bit of background on yourself and uh, for, for those that don't know you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Hua, for having this convo. It's a very important convo that I think is by far one of the most interesting things going on in the world, compliant cannabis in California. My background, I'm originally from Nashville, Tennessee, and I was uh, involved in cannabis in Tennessee and saw that I needed to get to California as soon as possible. So my story is definitely just the evolution of Loving cannabis so much, but just want to stay out of jail and stay out of trouble and moved out here in 2010 and was doing some brokering, of course, and other fun things. And then I started our delivery service, Marie's Deliverables, in 2015. We started our farm, which is in Salinas, California, about 150,000 mixed light greenhouse facility in 2017. We recently expanded. So it's just been an evolution from a criminalized place to a prop 215 place to a legacy operator to transitioning into prop 64 and all the evolutions of you know cannabis the last 15 years of my life you know you now have a, a vertically integrated cultivation distro delivery i mean those those lego pieces took years to put together and you know you only get one or two, maybe three cycles in a year to get those learnings in too. What does the the operation look like today? So we recently expanded. We recently expanded our footprint. So we had fifty thousand square feet of mixed light cultivation, and we recently took over another two acres, so hundred thousand square foot of canopy. So we're about at about one hundred and fifty thousand square feet of canopy. And it's definitely overwhelming. My brother's running around on the farm right now, just making sure that we can run everything on a perfected schedule. So more so just, of course, there's so much more flour than we normally have. My job now is to build a Smalls brand and figure out how exactly we want to move 
the majority of these smalls through either branded product or through our delivery service. We have a pending retail opening opportunity in Redwood City. So a lot of people have applied in Redwood City and we're one of them and we're in the final 18 and there will be six selected. So I'm in a really interesting place of business right now because I have a lot of different strategies. Of course, if we get this retail in Redwood City, because it's it's a dry county and this will be the first six retail in Redwood City. So we have a huge opportunity there to build the brand and just have a flagship retail that we can obviously vertically integrate so many products and highlight so many products into. Or if we're just going to have, and that location does have delivery. So it's retail and delivery. And that would really like just align the stars in my life for all the hard work, especially because we started in Redwood City. We had to leave Redwood City and we had their support, but they weren't going to give local authorization back then. So the evolution of my life right now is just a lot of pending. I don't know what's going to happen with this retail opportunity, but I want to be really prepared. Of course, if we do get this opportunity and then the farm has taken over, so much new space literally over the last month. So it's a little bit of like a shock to the system. And the reason why we took over that space that we did just to talk about why we're here is because the person next to us decided to stop operating there and go back to their original farms. They had overexpanded prices, of course, are so low that they decided to decrease their footprint. And we were able to just buy that business with plants in the ground, turnkey. So it put us a lot further ahead than our, our build out plans that we had in other places. So that is the key to life right now is just not putting in any money for that opportunity and immediately getting return when the market is so dismal, shall we say. You know, we've been through, we call them extinction events, right? And if we look at today's segment is surviving the storm of, of California cannabis or how to not get extinct. Um, and a lot of that has been caused with the, the price pendulum swings of flour. If we look at 215 glory days in a lot of ways, small businesses abound, thousands of operators working seamlessly in a lot of ways. And then comes 2017 going into 18, where the licenses were, were be, the temporary permits are being issued and flower drops right around then and then start shooting up again in 2018 for licensed flower. And if you were like caught that license in the right time, in the right county, in the right, right you, you shot up. And then we got into sort of some stabilization at some point, but illicit and the legal side. Now we, we got to go into the pandemic and prices skyrocket again everyone's smoking and now we're back to 2022 prices have come crashing down mainly because 2021 everyone's like oh let's put plants in the ground and leverage what we got 2020 so i mean is that an accurate interpretation of some of the the what's going on absolutely i would say farmers today right now there's probably 85 percent of the farmers across california especially greenhouse or outdoor farmers that are debating whether to plant is it worth me even sowing this soil for another run our cultivation taxes just went up somehow i'm still mesmerized by it but if we're at 160 plus dollars cultivation tax heaven forbid you're not automated and trimming and you have a high quality trim team those two things alone you're already at 270 dollars pound roughly plus your taxes and then where we are in in monterey which i'm not a fan of this we have a, a flat canopy tax which is super interesting to who because like as prices are really high our canopy tax was super high we had a 15 dollar per square foot canopy tax from 2016 when we signed our lease into 2016 2017 2018 and i don't remember exactly when it changed but it finally went from 15 dollars a square foot to five dollars a square foot and then all the farmers in monterey are still hurting of course so now it's at three dollars and we all believe it should either be a flat rate percentage gross tax so it can go up or down based upon your harvest or just done away with completely. But I mean, even when price is really, it's funny because the evolution of my life is like, I didn't, we didn't know how to grow weed and prices were really high at that point, but so were taxes. So the little, the little knowledge we had was just enough to pay taxes. Then as we've evolved our knowledge over the years, we've learned more and we've been able to save more and reinvest more and taxes have gone down. But now as taxes have gone down, everything else has gone up and the price of cannabis has gone down. 
I mean, even the cost for anything for construction or labor, everything is going up, but the price of cannabis is going down. Rents aren't necessarily changing as fast as the market is. That's one thing that's putting a lot of people out of business without even blinking. If your landlord is not willing to live with you in the market and understand the economics of this business, and they just expect you to go into debt to pay rent, that's not really what business is here for, right? That's not what necessarily we want to envision in America as building a business to keep to pay the government and your landlord, <laughs> which is really what's happening out here. So if you had a rent that was not, you know, under market to begin with, and now prices are so under market, one could say, or just compared to what they've been in the past, just your rent alone can put you out of business, especially from a cultivation perspective or really any perspective. And a lot of these businesses like rent, taxes, there's nothing left. Yeah. I mean, all those fixed costs, look at gas right now. It's like $6.15. And how do you really plan for that at all? Right. right. Even me, I'm like, should we be trading in the Nissans for Teslas? I'm like, I'm like debating, like, it, will I save more money paying a car note than this $6 gallon? And then we're like, of course, we don't know how long this gas price is even going to last. So such a volatile world we live in, right? And all of these things are so expensive. But even for my brother and I, like, we can't bet on prices going up. We just need to grow more wheat. Like, we don't have a problem selling weed because we live in an upper echelon of strains and just bag appeal and turf profile and all the things. Like, we're growing to make our greenhouse look like indoor. There's no other reason why we grow wheat. Like we want to grow passing, we got passers, right? Like we want you to look at our flower and not, you know, is this greenhouse? Is this indoor? If we were not doing that, Hua, we wouldn't even be having this conversation today. Our yeah. farm would have been out of business. We, I mean, we've already, like, we faced an eviction in 2018 that we avoided. We were always just hustling, like trying to make sure that we could pay all these bills, learn how to grow better flower and continue to yield more and just sharpen our sword. But 2018 wasn't very good for us. We were coming into compliance. We didn't really understand all the nuances. We were just paying way more than we were making. Taxes were so, I mean, literally $15 a square foot is unbearable. There's no other industry that has that. There's no other industry that even has like a tax at the agricultural farmer level, right? Like this is the only one. It's it's mind blowing. Not even oh, yeah, was... your your taxes at the local level or there's apportionment taxes. If you look at if you're shipping to different cities, use tax. I think two people always just look at the excise tax and the sales tax because that's what the customer facing tax is, right? But when you look at this flower, like a five hundred dollar pound wholesale ends up on the shelf for forty dollars an eight. That's a 10 times markup, but nobody's making any money. And when you look at the taxes, you got, of course, cultivation tax. But like we were talking about, you either have a canopy tax or you have a gross tax. Then you're moving that flower. You usually have a, a processing tax. You, of course, have a distro tax. Your local county will also give you some sort of tax. Then when you move it into retail, not even including sales tax or excise tax, there's other city taxes associated with that. Same thing for manufacturing. So it's overtaxed in every piece of the supply chain to the point literally where you know, I, I don't think that if you're growing mediocre flour, of course, and you're a smaller brand, like you will go extinct. If you haven't gone extinct already, you definitely will go extinct. It's only going to be the Bud Light and the Lagunitas on some levels because the evolution of California is just, it's sad, but it's not for small businesses. But to see California have extinction after extinction of small business, of small farmers, of small brands, all of these things are very, very eye-opening. Just when you look around the world, you're like, there's very few independent operators in any industry left in America today. And that is a problem. We've worked with the best and brightest from all walks of life in this industry. And it seems like with every turning of or every pendulum swing, we lose a bunch more. You know, that being said, whoever's left is like far in 300, ready to go. Um, and that would, that's what gives me a lot of hope and, you know, continues to further and fuel what we're, we're working on. We're like but, the Harvard, like of curriculums when it comes to cannabis in general, like California to me is Harvard. Like, if you can come here and you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. This is the hardest place to operate. It's the hardest place to exist in every market, every license type. I don't care what it is. If we took our same knowledge, me and you, and skipped over to even New York or any New Jersey, we would be so far ahead of any of the realistic like elements of putting together operations and understanding compliance and understanding permitting and planning and every single piece of the puzzle. But not only that, like 
understanding wheat. I think a lot about that. And coming from from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, mm. you know, you're from from Tennessee, and to have California cannabis is like the pinnacle of Holy cannabis, crap. right? And also the culture, right? It's, it's it. here. You yeah. can't you can't beat it. I mean, I'm not going to say not knocking on New York and Jersey, but the culture out here and and how it blends with everything, and it's a lifestyle. It's a vibe, right? Yeah. Right. It, it, it really well. Um, and replicate what we do here. Exactly. And, and so I, I'm still really bullish on California in, in the long term. It's just these short term, mid term aberrations that are, are really crushing. Props to you, especially because you've done a lot of this without a lot of in, uh, investment. You've been doing it with cash Not by flow. choice. <laughs> Not by choice. But then again, you're still it standing here <laughs> because you don't have investors that are pounding your door and saying, hey, where's the ROI? And you've been able to methodically invest in each of these things in order to grow your business. You know, what I've seen recently is the investors have come into play. If you've raised outside capital, not just a landlord situation, but all right, where are your capital, where's your capital company from? And what's the cost of that capital? And that cost being, you know, how much you need to return back? Who did you put on your board? How much did you dilute yourself and sort of your, your equity or how much debt did you take on? And did that debt convert into high interest rates or, you know, warrants into your company? You know, that's a whole nother paradigm that we're, we're also dealing with. For us, it's such, this is a catch 22. I kind of still like bang my head against the wall because I don't have the answer to it. But, you know, from my brother and I, we originally started with friends and family investment. We gave them crazy high interest and we just kept it moving. And anytime we need money, we went back to friends and family. And I mean, who are to the point where they don't need a performer. Every person that's given us money to this point, they're not institutional investors. They were just people who were willing to be our bank for that moment and trusted us. So it's like, we've had supporters. We've avoided a lot of really predatory situations with people with our farm, with our delivery, with all of these scenarios that if we had made a lot of these partnerships in the past, we would have lost our business. So we're very wary of that. Now with raising money for this indoor, we have this indoor in Greenfield that's about 14,000 square feet and we wanna raise about $3 million. And I found about a million and a half from an angel investor, good group. But immediately he's like, you know, I want to be on your board. I want to, I don't want to make decisions, but I kind of want to make decisions. And it's just like, you don't know the first thing about cannabis operations. I totally respect that you have money and that's great. But I like our business can't be put at a point where investors can step in and take over because that would have already happened to us. Originally, one thing that saved us is we always performed everything out at about $800 a pound. So now we're at about seven, eight, nine hundred dollars a pound for what we're growing, even though last year we were at 16, which was an anomaly. But normally we were at 13. So we always perform at about 40% lower than the market. So that's another reason why like, we've been able to survive this storm is because we always knew this is a commodity and commodities will be commoditized, right? So the price is going to be driven down, down, down. But as long as we can continue to at least keep the quality extremely high, then we know we'll be able to have a process of distribution, have a process of branding, and then hopefully create this brand. It, starting with the smalls would be the easiest thing because smalls are going for, you know, 200 to $300 a pound. It's almost like growing weed for free. That's insane. There needs to, we need to hold the floor. You know yeah. what I mean? I think yes. just like farmers are, are pricing in their pounds, buyers need to have a floor and there should not be grams left for a dollar in, in here in, in California. We, we have to hold the floor, anything below, right. You're, right. no one's making any money and, and that doesn't work out for anybody. Right. Because we're all here to make money. I always say this line of what criminalization couldn't kill legalization and regulation will all this time we've existed freely Two fifteen, we were making money. Prop 64, we went to raising money. If you were, weren't one of those few brands that had solidified yourself in the market in a really big way, you were not making money in Prop 64. That's just, you were raising money like nearly everyone else. When people were raising a lot of those rounds in that green rush era, people had crazy growth plans, mm -hmm. crazy pro formas, pounds that were like $3,600. Obviously, is growing the best. Has a master grower on there that's been doing it for a while on the deck. 
Right. But now when you kind of look at it, some a lot of those teams are struggling because these pivots in the market really needs agile teams. Yes. And those agile teams need to be able to make decisions quickly without the sunk cost fallacy of, oh, we well, we had all of this and now here we are. Because if you make that decision too too late, the market's already moved again. And now you're playing catch up two feet behind where right. the market's already moved. And it's the irony too of this isn't what we thought, right? Like we thought bigger would be better in some, I know I did. Like my first deal, even with my delivery, it was like not only a stay licensed, but I'm like, oh, it's other people's money. That's always nice. And I can expand faster. I can grow faster. I can do all these faster, but it does not matter. The analogy I like to use is like a jet ski in the water versus a barge, right? Our market requires you to be a jet ski. And that is also like, that's the reason my brother and I survive is because like we're ultimate pivoters in the moment. If something's not working, we can stop it. We don't have to call 16 people and get our strategy team on the line and like every stakeholder, like, no, we don't like this. This needs to stop now. But if we were not as agile and able to pivot as fast as we could and make these decisions as fast as we can, and truly because it's just the two of us, we wish we had a CFO. That's one thing that we really need. If we had a third person, like that's our, our whole that we have to rely too heavily on outside accounting for. That money, a lot of times it turns you into those slugs, you know, it turns you into that barge. And not only that, but now you're indebted to these decisions that people are going to give you that are based on potentially really good, insightful business decisions. And I don't care what CFO you had in the world. No one probably would have predicted prices dropping 40% this year. It's like hindsight's 2020. I think about when we were in Meadowlands last year and we were all looking at sort of trying to figure out the crystal ball. I don't think we would have predicted, well, A, there was just so much more inventory that came online, so many more licenses that were issued, and coupled with the delay of the retail environment, there should have been way more retail, right? The other side of it is there hasn't been enforcement on the illicit market, and that illicit market, I'm not just saying domestically in California, I'm saying in other states, right? Um, and I think with the- Oklahoma. The, Oklahoma- Yeah, anywhere that you see some where you don't have to go all the way to California to get your your cannabis. So we had sort of two ends of the the candle that were were burning here, which really hurt a lot of people. And, you know, to your point on quality, quality still survives. There are enough people that want quality that will pay above market for that. The issue that I'm finding is greenhouse, indoors working, outdoor seems to be getting crushed in it. And I've had some amazing outdoor. Yeah, and I love so, the highest terpene profile is, in my opinion, is usually an outdoor. I mean, you get yep. the full spectrum of the sun. You get a lot bigger plants. I mean, they're just, they're very terpy. I'm yeah, sad for terpy. every outdoor cultivator, period, in California right now. If I drop tears it's immediately for outdoor cultivators especially with no brand there's so much that we could go down right the recriminalization of growing which it's a plant you know it's never killed anyone but how as an operator do we compete with that market we have driven this market into a place where it's not making us any money but to to make a felony growing 99 plants am i for that no, no. I'm happy that Oklahoma is finally going on metric. And I do think that'll have some sort of trickle up effect for California in a weird way. But if you're an outdoor farmer with no brand, that is going to be an extinction soon. You know, it's crazy because you know, I love some outdoor flower here and there and mainly because of the terpene profile, but also it's, it's a little bit less potent. So I don't have to get too crazy. But it's also to your point, some of the, the cultivators that I gravitate toward our biodynamic or have sun earth certification i think the consumer that's the other you know part of it doesn't have the education on the other side of why i should try other flower than just high potency yes that is definitely the the nut to crack too in california is the miseducation we had some of this in prop 215 and i refused to put lab tests on my prop 215 site because i would tell everybody i'm like you pay for these Like, I'm not going to sit here and like, these are not necessarily that real or true. And I, I still feel that way, Hua. And we all know what it is out here and that tests can be not only like, let's say you're not doing anything else, but shopping for the highest potency. Like that's what you, that's what a lot of brands do. They shop for the highest potency and they roll it up. And that's that. 
potency for me though is i i think related to like saturation in your body like there's only so much saturation with thc your body can even take in like when you're smoking or when you're vaping or whatever it is like it can't take in 88 percent thc out of your vape you know that's not what your body is doing and the focus being only on terpenes and i love how like the science is just basically saying sativa is not real indica is not real hybrids you know and hybrid sure hybrid strain but just the fact that it's all about the terpenes. Everything is about the terpenes and the highest terpene comes from sun-grown wheat, period. I have a friend, their, their son and earth certified. They actually have the first OCAL equivalent certification, Sonoma Hills Farm in Petaluma. They have beekeeping on the sides of their THC flower. And these bees, even though it's all female, right? It's all feminized. They go over all the plants and their terps are usually like four and a half percent on oh this my God. outdoor power. Oh, yeah. And they, they think it's because the bee pollination, like the bees are carrying the terps from plant to plant and they think that like that is increasing. It's mind blowing to me. Do I love high grade indoor flower? Yes. Is that the majority that I normally consume? Yes. But do I love some good outdoor and do I think like that is also the most medically oriented plant? 110%. Yeah. And, and that's why I'm like really excited about solventless. You know, I think that's one of the, the keys of surviving if you're outdoor. Solventless. I mean, with the prices where they're at, go into this fresh press, live rosin dabbing that where the, the technology is really caught up. Yeah. Right? I don't no longer have to use an, a nail. I can use my, my Puffco or even right. some of these like portables. It just right. it could be really, really, really terpy yep. and capture it. Outdoor flower into rosin done. That would that is like the best tasting rosin, in my opinion, would come from like a really high terpy outdoor flower. And then the one thing we haven't even talked about, too, is that what's killing us are taxes. Just and nothing is going to change until we can decrease the taxes and have a sensible strategy to allow farmers to make money, operators to make money, distributors to make money, the entire market to make money. So we're not going to stay here just to make Uncle Sam rich. Like we know that there is a huge factor in these larger cities, whether it's LA, San Francisco, Oakland. San Francisco, at least the police come. That is a good thing. But in Oakland, I hear story after story after story where the police tell you to go online and like submit your report online and they don't even come. It's really, really sad for someone like me. Like I'm a small business. I can't imagine, let's say this retail in Redwood City. I can't imagine getting that and then losing everything I have in it. We're stretched so thin already. As tough as all of these things are that we're already competing with, right? And then to just think about the fact that, you know, we have to spend 10 times the amount on security and we're not necessarily protected. Like being in, outside of a, a metropolitan city, us being in Salinas, us being out there with the ag labor, ag pricing, ag rent, that is something we can sustain. Like we would not be, I wouldn't even be able to be one of those people that could bounce back from robbery after robbery after robbery. It just unless insurance is literally cashing me out, which I haven't really seen that happen for most of these cases, I would be done. No, I, I hear you. There isn't much relief coming immediately. Right. So unless you have buffer or more investors or some money hidden somewhere, right. you're in trouble. You know, you have to pay for more packaging costs, especially for people that have been in this longer. Right. They have sustained the hits where they've already emptied out multiple rounds of it. And I'm hopeful, though, there are six bills this year mm -hmm. on reducing taxes. We have Quirk's bill, Rubio's bill, McGuire's, Bradford's, Bradford's. Wiener's bill. But I think Bradford I think, is the one I'm most aware of. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean, by far, like that's that. the best right. one, right? It's like elimination of cultivation. We have to also be practical on what we can get across the aisle. It you know, requires a two-third vote. But one thing I'm also happy about is there's more unification of the industry. I think everyone's seeing the pain or is feeling the pain. And it does feel like red flags, last hurrah, got to make some change here and like sort of overcome our differences in the supply chains because we're all so thoroughly connected. Definitely. So I'm happy about that. I'm happy with more retail, hopefully coming online, fingers crossed. So many cities, even when they do, they're like, we are going to accept licenses. Three years, four years later, retail gets open. And that's what, what, what pains me. And, and we should definitely touch on this is, you know, watching and, and hearing from your past interviews and you talked about equity and how, you know, you get this golden ticket, but you get to the gate and you, you need a silver dollar, right? I think that's what you, you were talking about. And that, that makes so much sense in, in a lot of ways, because 
a lot of the equity operators are going live now, right? And right. have had to succumb to either predatory capital or had to make some some deals that they may not have wanted to make if they were able to go earlier. And they're coming into the market at sort of some of the lowest price points that we're seeing. So depending on where you are in the supply chain, it doesn't look that great for you. No. But then again, like social equity is the first of its kind in any industry. The fact that it's an equity is, is sort of the tip of the spear and I hope it can go into you know other industries, but where does social equity go from here? Because we talked about New Jersey, you talked about New York, they're staging up their programs. Right. Illinois has one, hasn't really launched one license yet. And this is what, four years in? Over right. there, who are the people that you meet that have a lot of skin in the game already, have saved a little money, even, you know, are really looking at this as like transitioning from their legacy opportunity into a compliant opportunity. Most of them are trying to avoid equity programs because it will slow down their opportunity of being able to transition with some of the same medical operators or MSOs and be able to compete. The equity programs in general, they're all very similar in some ways where they're not funded enough by unbiased funds, right? Whether it's coming in from outside interest or whether it's not government money or whether there's just no money or whether the money is coming out way after the fact. Even in California, the state gave California cities all of this money and the cities hemmed and hawed before they even gave it to anyone. And then they didn't even want to give it to the equity operators. They wanted to write the check to an attorney or write the check to your architect. They just don't want to give the money to the people who deserve the money and are supposed to be able to operate with that money. In San Francisco, the first grant was so bad, it was a reimbursement only. So I'm supposed to be broke and then spend a hundred grand. And then you're going to reimburse me that hundred grand. It's not equity that's broken. It's this entire industry that is broken. The cannabis industry economics of this entire scenario is very contradicting in itself and does not make sense. Yeah, you know, we went through the whole thing. We were advocating all the way. So I think all of us have a share of blame in how this broken system came to be. I think the problem is the way laws are written, the regulatory cycles they are, it's really hard to unwind. And I think if we knew how entrenched these rules it became, then we wouldn't have been so stringent with the language and the different licenses types and the different agencies managing it. Prop 215 was like two paragraphs. When I look at sort of the, the path forward, we need to create, especially for small businesses, other license types, right? If you look at cottage industries or culinary industries or anything like that, there is a cottage that you, there is something for smaller operators and get online and get going right away. And, and the fact that equity, you have to be an owner doesn't really make sense to me. Not everyone wants to be a founder and, and not everyone should. There should be a pathway for everything, right? Exactly. Number one, only giving someone the opportunity to run a business in a, the most business, difficult business, excuse me, ever, not necessarily the best only option, right? CEO. Yeah. I think Maine, it was, they have an equity program that's like, if you want to be a manager, there's a management program, there's an employee program, there's a, you know, COO level, CEO level, there's multiple layers of directing people naturally, because we're all not the same. And we all don't want to own a cannabis company, but we have been impacted by the war on drugs negatively. And we should be given some sort of opportunity. That's what another thing is just like, what about the people? Yeah, we have these licenses, but everyone's not going to be able to get a license. Yeah, we have these equity programs, but most people have seen these programs and seen a lot of issues with them, and maybe they don't want to go that route. What about ancillary businesses? What about opportunities for small businesses, exactly like you're saying, like cottage and cottage industries? It's sad that in California right now, if I hear someone tell me they're going to start cultivating and they say like 5,000 square feet, the instant thing I think is you're going to fail. What, what it's kills like, me, though, is not the square footage. It's like the diversity in there is going to be one strain, two strains. Whereas like where I loved in, in Prop 215 was just the diversity of the menu because people could grow four pounds, five pounds, and, and that's enough of each of these strains. And they knew they could just get it off of their inventory pretty quickly. It, there is better flour every day outside of the compliant market than inside the compliant market. There is some issues with getting these strains through metric now everything since nothing gets packaged at the retailer like we used to package everything 
per order fresh. Now everything's coming. It's getting harvested. It's getting trimmed. It's getting packaged. It's getting sent to the distro. This distro sits on it forever, hems and haws. By the time it finally sells into a retailer, that retailer, that, that product is that one eighth has sat in that jar for who knows how long compared to Prop 215. That's my number one side to terpenes is like the freshness. I need to be able to grind it where flour moisture has a little bit of that gravity that kind of sinks into itself, you know? Yes. That's what I'm looking for. I can't have Fire the powder. Pulverized weed. Yeah, it's, just, it's tough. Ooh, everybody hates that, right? But when you think about the strain diversity, when you think about like how we used to be able to create so many new strains and get them to market so fast and have them be so fresh, now that same process is like... Yeah, we covered a lot of ground here. And, I, you know, for the, this last piece, I'd love to focus on sort of the road ahead. You know, you, you volunteer your time with success centers. We do as well. There are new batches of people coming into this industry all the time. I worry for them, but I'm also excited for them because they have the energy and the enthusiasm. Kind of ignorance is bliss a little bit too. Mm -hmm. Some new ideas and, and things that we may not have been thinking about as we may be a little bit jaded or narrow in our perspective. You know, what is the advice? How would you talk to someone to navigate the path forward as we look in sort of this year, maybe 2023 and beyond? Yeah. What, what, do we, what nuggets do you have there? Right. I think that like we all were really obsessed with ownership of licenses in the beginning, where with the new up and coming groups, the more that they're understanding IP and franchising and licensing and even like these shared manufacturing licenses that are coming up, trying to launch the business and go to market. If you're new, like I love it. I love it. You know, if I interview someone that's in cannabis, they're going to be like, I'm in cannabis. I love it. It's been great the last five years. I interview someone that's coming from any other industry. They're like, cannabis. Oh my gosh, I want to get into cannabis so bad. This is all I dream about. We are jaded, I will say. And you don't want to jade them, but you do want to like set them up for success with all the unknowns that we do have, which like the number one thing I can say is trying to use the regs and use other licenses and other people in the supply chain that have already waited the two years, that have already secured the license. And you do, you know, some sort of licensing deal to go to market with their equipment, with their business or a shared space where you can have your own license on a shared space. I think those elements are very key for like the equity community and those people like myself that if I wanted to get into cannabis right now, I would not have enough money to secure a permit from the same style of where I was in my life when all of this went and evolved into Prop 64. We evolved everything because we were here. If we had to recreate that now, it would just be out of control. So, you know, the moment I hear people getting into cultivation, it's so expensive and there's so many unknowns. There's enough flour being brokered that you can start a brand. There's enough distros that will white label that you could get a brand created without literally owning a license in the supply chain. And if you are super passionate and that's an angle you want, then don't do what, you know, we all did in 2018 per se and grab all these buildings and these leases and these licenses and not have a business. The number one thing is customers. If you have customers, you can raise money. If you have customers, you have a business. If you don't have customers and all you have is a lease and a license and no customers, you're going to look like a lot of businesses out here that have already either gone out of business or they just keep the license active to hope to sell it. Looking towards the future, I just think that like going to market with simplistic mindset and understanding like the market is ever changing and constantly moving and don't go too deep. Do not put all your eggs in one basket. You know, make sure that you can stay lean like we were talking about. You want to be the jet ski. You don't want to be the barge. Predatory. I mean, this this whole industry is so predatory. So really, really want to vet everyone that you, that you do business with. I get calls all the time from like bad buyout deals in LA from storefronts for equity operators that haven't even opened yet, right? Where they're going through so much and they haven't even opened. So making sure you really, really vet your partner, I think is that is the key to a lot of this. When stuff hits the fan, you know, when you can't pay your rent or you can't pay payroll or you need to go figure out exactly what you're gonna do to make those things happen, and you call your partner, you need solutions, and you have to live with people that are actually trustworthy and there for you. You know, you gotta think about what all the things that can happen that are gonna go wrong in your contract, in your operations, in your lease, in your business, in the permitting. I, so many times people think, oh, Marie, this is gonna take a year. I don't know, it could take three. Since I would try to create a business on someone else's license, and then if I was making enough money, then I'd go try to 
secure yeah. licenses, right? No, but, we're seeing a lot of that sort of um, asset light model, right? Yes. But that, your assets are really your, your IP, your branding, your marketing. We stay in our lane, right? We, Meadow, we just, we build our software. You know, we're not successful unless operators are successful. That's like, has been way our tenants, like if no one uses it, then we're not, right. we're not providing value. And, you know, when I look at some other teams that try to invest in building their own thing, or like went with a third party in a, another country that ha- doesn't even speak their language and doesn't know the, the regulations. Talk about partnerships we've worked on for a long time and relationships. How has our journey been so far in sort of using Meadow and any feedback? And if you had to like look at the, you know, our roadmap, what would we, what would you want in addition to sort of what we have already? Man, I think my dream come true would be able to put that retail software in Redwood City if I was just going to be boom and, you know, work with you. I've never been able to use, I've never had a retail, right? I've been delivery only for so long, was on Meadow for so long and was really, really happy. And then all of these crazy things happened in my life and then tested out Kova when I was brought on to that other license. Didn't like that. Um, Have had some experience with Blaze. Like there's definitely like a robustness to certain things. And then there's a beauty to simplicity and things working. I kind of like equate Meadow to like the iPhone. From a standpoint of like, all I want to do is sell weed and sell a lot of weed and do it really well. And I never thought that technology would play such a huge role in me selling weed. Just in the beginning of my life, never, I never thought like I would understand, you know, the API integrations and what needs to take place and what's triggered when to make my customer experience as fluid as I want it to be. But technology is everything. I mean, I think the future of cannabis, of course, good weed. And after that, it'll be won and lost by technology. Yeah, I mean, we kind of look at it sort of what are the tools that give you leverage. I mean, we launched dynamic delivery, the, you know, the ice cream truck model uh, last year. Now the, the proposed regulatory changes are advocating for $10,000 trunk size. So instead of going from $3,000, $3,000 in your inventory, no orders, mm-hmm. or $5,000 with a pre-order, you know, $10,000 now can actually start being profitable. Ooh. We went from unlimited to 10, to five, to three. And I think that was, that was really the experience for me where I saw like the, the biggest needs in technology and like who can keep up with the government. Exactly. You know, like, like I was like, if I can carry around unlimited product, it doesn't matter. I don't really need scheduled orders as bad, but if I can only carry $3,000 and I've gotten $50,000 in this room, how do I show this product to all these other people in the room? So them in, that was my biggest battle was like the menu size with the delivery, like back in the day, you know, 250 items, then the 10 K case for like, okay. And then the par levels alone, like if you're an ounce, if you sell ounces or something, you might leave with like 10 SKUs. Yeah. And not to mention sort of your kit management, your track and trace. And, you know, ultimately to your point, what, what is the customer experience? Right. So, you know, now we're seeing operators on the delivery side that were hub and spoke that have now just sort of added on dynamic, but dynamic in a way where they're already in route to a customer. And that menu that's shown, you know, on their site is has an option to do an express from that trunk mm-hmm. and shows you the inventory there. Or if they can wait a little longer, they'll go to the main menu. So that dynamic shift for the customer to is super mm-hmm. important. And, you know, what we've been seeing is you can go out and do your delivery. All of a sudden you got two pings and you've made an extra 200% on your way back right. than you would have had just on, on one trip. Right. I, I guess wrapping up here, one thing, you know, we've all heard is uh, you just drop so much different knowledge. You've shared a lot. Uh, you also have a consulting service called Legacy Coterie. Do you want to talk about that for a moment? And just, you know, for if people are looking for help, what do you specialize in and, and how can you support them? Legacy Coterie is started out for sure as just passion projects and helping equity and helping people get licensed. And we've we've seen a group, about a dozen now of different people that we've been able to help consult through licensing in San Francisco. And then because of all of the different things that we've been working with and just learning and all different license types and go to market strategies. Right now I'm doing some consulting in New York and New Jersey and Virginia. And really those are my favorite or just markets that are a little bit undeveloped because I have 
a sense of being able to see how the development should go at least. And based on the license types that are available can help people find the money. I can use my expertise just from distribution or brand building or being a buyer for so long or what the market is looking for, or what the market can sustain or voids in the marketplace and help you go to market a lot faster. Awesome. Thank you for that. And so there you have it, surviving the storm. And I hope we get to survive many more storms together. Right, right. Um, you know, <laughs> hurricane so, you know, season. Hurricane season. And then we can lay on the beach and and rejoice that we are still here. Thank you so much. This has been great. I think we share a similar passion for this plant. All the stuff aside, we love cannabis. And I think we also have very good perspective that this is still a golden opportunity. Strong relationships will allow us to keep going for the long term. Let's be real. Whoever's selling it is going to change, but cannabis is going to be here for a very long time. Right, right. No, so, absolutely. And I think too, you know, as long as we persevere and we hold on and we figure out ways to survive as hard as it is, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing no matter how hard this is. Cause I, I love weed so much. This is really all I really ever want to do is grow and sell weed. We are watching prohibition be created in all these government ways. So it's, it's definitely no, no easy fight that we're in, but I mean, we're here. And we're going to stay here. Thanks so much for joining us here today. Follow on LinkedIn for future episodes where every month we'll dig into different aspects of the cannabis retail ecosystem and share insight to help dispensaries thrive. Learn more at getmeadow.com. Take care, everybody.